Hello everyone and welcome to today's special webinar session, COVID-19, Pharma Supply Chain Security and Robustness During Global Pandemic Panel Discussions Sponsored by ISPE. My name is Barbara Peck. I'm the Manager of Industry and Community Recognition at ISPE. Uh, before we jump into our topic, I do have a few housekeeping items to cover. Um, now, today's session is a live panel discussion where we'll be taking some uh, questions from the audience as well as answering some that we received during the registration process. Um, we will be recording the session and we'll share with regist registrants within 24 hours of the end of today's session. Um, please use the chat feature in the control panel to submit your questions for the panelists. Um, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can, but we only have about an hour for this session, so we might miss some, but uh, we will be following up with our panelists and um, and be using some of your uh, questions and your feedback to prepare uh, and develop future content. Now, today we're joined by our moderators, Nick Davis, who is the managing partner of Verda Life Sciences, and Oliver Stoffer, who's the CEO of PTI Inspection Systems. Um, they're both going to be helping with the panelists and answering some of the questions. Um, now, Nick and Oliver are both very active members of ISPE and jointly chair the ISPE Supply Chain Operations and Packaging Steering Committee. Now, our team has put together a panel of experts who's who are going to discuss the current challenges um, that we're facing in keeping a supply chain operational during a global pandemic crisis like what we're currently experiencing with COVID-19. Now, Nick, I'm going to pass control over you to introduce our speakers. Thank you. Barbara, thank you very much and uh, welcome everybody. I'm, I'm sure that we've all seen and heard the stories about shortage of test kits, respirators, PPPs, and the heroic efforts of our first-line responders doctors and nurses as they grapple with this pandemic. This webinar isn't focused on that. It's focused on the supply of global medicines in these uncertain times. As we know, the manufacturing supply of pharmaceuticals requires a truly global network with manufacturing sites, supply chains, stretching across countries and continents. These supply chains are increasingly coming under strain as countries and individuals cope with the impact of COVID-19. Supplies of registered starting materials, APIs, excipients, consumables, packaging materials, drug products, finished goods, PPE, etc., are all being impacted as countries globally, such as China, India, Italy, Spain, the UK, the US, etc., are being affected and supplies disrupted. Today, we're joined by a, a panelist who are going to share with us the experience of their companies in dealing in ensuring the supply of these life saving medicines. Our panelists are Joy Depp Ganguly, Senior Vice President of Corporate Relations at Gilead Sciences, Robert Hanfield, Executive Director, Supply Chain Resource Cooperative, the Poole College of Management, North Carolina State University. Christian Morello, Head of Supply Chain Planning and Program Management, Lonza Pharma and Biotech. Jan Throne, Managing Director of Sales at UPS Healthcare. Timo Usager, Vice President, Supply Chain and Customer Project Management, Better Pharma. I'm going to give each one of our panelists a few moments to tell, it, tell, them, tell us about themselves and give us some perspective of how their companies are dealing with the issues. And with that, I'm going to pass over first to Joy Depp. Joy Depp, can you perhaps uh, introduce yourself and tell us what uh, Gilead are doing? Thanks, Nick. Thanks for the introduction and thanks, Barbara. So, uh, my name is Joydeep Ganguly, as uh, Nick introduced, I'm the Senior Vice President of Corporate Operations at Gilead. In, in that role, I uh, look after uh, a few facets of our company's uh, value chain, uh, engineering facilities, uh, the design and uh, delivery of some of our uh, uh, large assets that actually make uh, these life-saving therapies. I also have a, a, a remit around the procurement and uh, sourcing aspects of a supply chain, which is getting really tricky with this uh, with this pandemic apart, pandemic upon us. Um, I think with a perspective I'm going to try and do, besides uh, the problems that Gilead's facing are no different than the problems, you know, most of the large biopharma companies are facing. We've all got distributed supply chains, uh, which, uh, 
you know, a few months ago was the, the classic signature way of ensuring robustness by having a worldwide network very intricately connected, uh, linked uh, across the globe. And, uh, and I think uh, where we are finding out right now uh, are, are most of our, uh, our, our problems, besides having an employee workforce that is digitally well connected, engaged and culturally attuned to a common mission, is to try and uh, almost play a puzzle with this distributed supply chain to ensure that the supply chain is robust, it's resilient and it is able to have all the logistics as well as the planning elements work seamlessly. Uh, and it's led to some interesting nuances that Nick, I'm sure we'll get into with the panelists, but I'm um, here to provide Gilead's perspective, but also take a look at some of the industry imperatives that are soon being reshaped uh, in the face of this, uh, this pandemic. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Nick. Thank you, Joda. Rob, Rob, at NC State, I know that you've been looking at supply chains, in particular the ability to cope with pandemics. Can you perhaps introduce yourself and give your perspective? Sure. I, my pleasure to be here today. Um, <clears throat> I'm Rob Hanfield. I'm a professor of supply chain management. I've been teaching and doing research in supply chains for about 30 years. Um, worked with a large number of pharmaceutical companies, uh, pharmaceutical distribution companies, and, and hospitals. So uh, quite familiar with, with the sector. Um, we've been working <clears throat> with a, a number of different uh, entities right now on this particular problem around supply of uh, healthcare products uh, and services. Um, working with a, a joint acquisition task force is being led by uh, the Air Force, um, and, and their goal is, is to focus on resilience, but also uh, supply and, and smaller business. Uh, we're also working with the Public Spend Forum, um, and we've been looking at ventilator supply and, and, and demand and also with the uh, North Carolina State uh, College of Textiles, College of Industrial Engineering, and uh, doing some, some interesting work uh, there. Um, my role right now is, is I'm working with some of the graduate students to help put together a, a database of specs, uh, companies producing PPE, uh, companies capable of producing not just masks and gowns, but the fabric, and uh, also working with a group at MIT who are creating some incredible software, uh, the Helena Group, to match healthcare providers with critical needs to product supply chains. Um, you know, the, the, the big issue I see right now is um, the supply chain is, is, uh, is, is really disconnected. There, there's a lot of activity going on uh, across the US, across the world for that matter. Uh, it's not very well connected and all these entities are sort of working on their own um, you know, to, to get what they need to support their own their own providers, and um, that's causing an awful lot of confusion in the marketplace, and uh, not to mention, um, you know, different entities that shouldn't even be in the marketplace are, are popping up as well. So um, it, it's really a pleasure to be here today. I'm I'm looking forward to discussing some of these things. Thank you, Rob. That's great. Uh, Christian, can you perhaps give your perspective on what Lons are doing? Definitely. Thank you, Nick. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christian Morello. I'm the head of the supply chain planning and program management within Lonza Pharma Biotech. Lonza is a CDMO company offering development services, clinical and manufacturing, uh, commercial manufacturing uh, for chemical, biological and also cell and gene therapies. So we have a global footprint with uh, more than 30 manufacturing and R&D sites across Asia, Europe, and US. And uh, we are facing a global, uh, a global impact due to the COVID. And what I can say that there is no technology, there is no site, there is no country that is not uh, impacted by, uh, uh, by this, uh, um, this epidemic. And uh, to echo what uh, Rob said, uh, the supply chain more than ever is a, a very important element of uh, the, the activities that uh, we are all running. And it is not just taking care about one piece that is the, as the raw material, or it's much more complex than that. It's impacting the raw material for sure. It is also impacting the workforces. It's also impacting the logistics. So it is all the ability of our industry uh, to uh, 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 able, enable, in fact, the, the nurses and the doctor, uh, providing them with the materials and providing them with the 
the drugs that will be at the end uh, helping the patient. So it is uh, an interesting time. It is just the beginning and uh, I'm very eager to, to have this discussion today and to exchange with you and address any question. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Christian. That's, that's fantastic. And, and Jen, can you perhaps give us a, a perspective of what UPS are doing in particular? You're right at the delivering material, not just along the supply chain, but also to the hospitals and clinics directly impacted. Correct. So my particular area of expertise is more on the distribution and logistics side, I think. Um, you know, there's been met much coverage in the news of our transportation network um, really focusing on, on delivering uh, packages and, and shipments and being able to, to um, take on additional, what we call lift, additional volumes, um, and being able to transition some of the volumes perhaps in the healthcare side that are dropping a bit uh, on, on, in our other sectors. On the distribution side, we have seen a call to action from many of the state and federal agencies, uh, as well as, as some, some individual manufacturers, everyone coming together to try and obtain products, primarily PPE and getting test kits. So getting those products sourced, being able to consolidate them in a single location, and then being able to push them out um, very quickly. So for us, just speed, and being able to re react immediately uh, are really the, the requests we've been seeing in the market uh, from an L&D side of the house. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and, and Timo, in terms of VETA, um, how are you feeling the impact and dealing with it? Yeah, hello together. So um, I'm responsible at VETA for the procurement and the customer project management. Procurement means uh, we are sourcing all the stuff which is needed at FETA and customer project management we, means uh, we are introducing in our team new customer projects um, at FETA. Um, one sentence maybe to FETA, we are also a CDMO like Lonza. We are um, a service provider for the pharmaceutical industry for aseptic filling and packaging of syringes and other injection zip systems. Uh, we are yeah, maybe a mid-sized company, privately owned and located in Germany. What we're doing as um, at our perspective, the situation um, is really changing a lot so far. Um, today, uh, one topic is green and uh, tomorrow it's red. And this changes uh, very, very fast. We have installed several boards looking at these situations. Um, and one core topic is uh, communication. Communication means internally with our staff, with our colleagues, with our employees, uh, communicate what the situation, what is ongoing within FETA, within our area where our production sites are located, but also in um, the, the, the communication with our customers, which is the situation as FETA is producing life-saving products and medicines for their patients, we are, um, it's really important to give our um, customers an overview about the situation and also communication with our suppliers. What are they doing with the status there? And um, all our teams are focusing on these kind of topics, communication in the different areas, as mentioned, employees within FETA, communication with customers and also with our suppliers. Fantastic. Thank, thank you, Timo. Thank you all for agreeing to participate in this webinar. Um, I see that we've, we've had over a thousand people actually register for this webinar, which is a fantastic number. And um, as I look at my screen now, I can see we've got actually over 580 or more people actually listening in. Um, we know this is a global issue. And in fact, when I looked earlier on today, the, where we're seeing people dialing in from, we had people dialing in from over 64 countries. So that means we're not going to be answering questions specific to one country. We're not going to make this just a US subject or a European subject. This is a global subject, as we all know about. And neither are we going to talk about specific products or medicines um, we're going to talk about, in a more general terms, what can we do to ensure the supply of medicines. So with that, thank you all for dialing in. Um, hopefully you're going to find this very interesting. 
And I suppose now's the time to flip over and start asking some of your questions. Um, we asked everybody to provide, uh, we asked people to provide one or two questions as part of the registration process. Um, I think you, you can actually go ahead and make questions, put que your questions in online. I would say we've had more questions than we could ever possibly answer in this short period of time. So as Barbara talked about earlier, we'll, we'll address how we might deal with those later. So let, let me, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to raise the question. I'm going to ask one of the panelists to answer it from their perspective. And then we're going to open that question up for the rest of the panelists to, to add to, the, to their responses from their individual perspectives as well. Um, and I think we've already heard, and I think uh, Joy Depp, you gave a great inter in your introduction talk about what you're seeing as an impact from the supply chain. Um, I wonder if you want to perhaps expand on what are the issues that you are actually seeing today um, that are actually impacting your ability to supply products? Joy Depp, do you want to start with that? Yeah. Sure, Nick. Um, so I'll keep this high level. And again, I'll, uh, I loved your point about trying to make this country agnostic because this is a global group listening in. And rather than overwhelm this audience with the macro level issues, the, the micro level issues that we are facing on a day to day basis, just trying to keep everything running, uh, sort of group them into three massive categories, right? One of them is the decentralized nature of our supply chain is um, has complexity built in and that com the price of the complexity is better economics, better resilience. Uh, but we're finding out trying to uh, sort of collapse our supply chain to simplified levels where we are assured of the flow of goods and services between those sort of uh, uh, nodes and arms is, is, is a big problem right now. And uh, there's an area of supply chain visibility that we are, we are grappling with. And I think we are finding the companies that are doing better than the rest are companies that have invested copiously in supply chain visibility tools in the past. And now they're able to very quickly point out inventory levels, stock levels, batch record levels, lead time levels at those various nodes. So there's an element around supply chain visibility and simplicity that's coming to the fore. Um, the second area of, I think, um, uh, not concern, but, a, but a bit of an area that's top and front and center is trying to find ways to take things that were previously very, very manual that are very required in-person kind of interactions and try and make everything technology enabled, right? Uh, things that were considered irreverent, Nick, uh, a couple of months ago, like doing an FAT over Zoom with Google Glasses now are becoming par for the course. And it's uh, a perverse kind of <laughs> a byproduct of this, this this pandemic has been that it's almost constrained us to innovate uh, to try and, uh, and and get past this hurdle right now. So we are seeing a lot of organic innovation now becoming par for the course and just the basic routine stuff. And I think again, companies that have a culture around uh, around sort of breaking the status quo is is, is working and they are working out well. And the third point, and I know you and I have talked offline about this, is this is also. Uh, you know, uh, sort of testing our, our, our inherent mental models around collaboration within the industry and with regulators, right? We've been very uh, insular as a industry about trying to, you know, partly driven by IP concerns, but partly driven by, you know, uh, the way we've sort of operated our value chain. And I think them seeing a, a, an unprecedented amount of cooperation, not just with the regulatory bodies, but with industries, with supply partners, um, with, with local cities and local regulations. And I think it's bringing out the best in the industry as well. So thematically, I'll just pause right now, but the supply chain visibility and simplicity, the technology enablement, and this newfound collaboration that's spurring the innovation is, is a, it's a glass half full answer, but it's some, some of the stuff that Gilead's grappling with right now. Fantastic, George, George yeah, but that's very, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll pick up some of those points as we go through the rest of the session, but maybe I can pass it over to Christian to talk about it from a longer perspective. Thank you, Nick. <clears throat> Indeed, just to, to, to echo what uh, uh, Deep said about uh, the interaction and the communication. For the CDMO, it's we are here to serve the customer and we're here to adapt as well to the demand. So this crisis that we are facing, is not only impacting the raw material, but it's also impacting the, the strategy and the, and the development for some component from the, our customer. So we need as well to adapt here based on the, on the demand. We may have, we to every day we have some request to increase such a type of uh, component. Then there was some delay on the clinical trial. So the agility and the flexibility together with a strong communication and partnership with the customer are the main driver. And we, it's a daily activity here to maintain this uh, connection. 
to be able to adapt uh, uh, if we don't have the, the raw material in due time to move one production for, to replace one production to another to uh, also listen and uh, getting close to the customer to really make sure that what uh, uh, we are doing is fitting with their needs and the current needs could be on a clinical side could be a commercial side and this is the main driver um, this is also an opportunity for the the, the cdmo and probably Timo can as well comment on that because we are dealing with multiple type of project, multiple type of uh, 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 at a different size as well. So we used to have such a type of uh, flexibility into the system, into the, the asset as well, uh, moving from one product to another. And this is a must have today. Honestly, when you saw the, 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 the difficulty that are changing every day, uh, uh, could be a uh, raw material, could be the PPE, could be uh, the, the people as well, because we need to think as well to our people that are needed to produce and uh, uh, making sure they, they can work, they are not contaminated, they can uh, uh, be safe as well as delivering. It's, uh, it's a, ch a daily challenge and this is where the, the flexibility and again the communication with customers are key. Fantastic, thank you Christian. Uh, Timo, can you perhaps add to that from a VETA perspective? Uh, yes, uh, it's completely the same uh, for FETA that uh, we are also a CDMO as mentioned and uh, also one of our core competencies is to adapt to different demand scenarios and to changing targets to uh, to changing the supply situations and for this reason um, that's the feeling which, which I have from our team from the FETA team is that uh, they are working really um, in a collaborative way with our customers with our suppliers together uh, to have answers to the current situation as they are normally also used to this situation where uh, things are changing. Um, as uh, just mentioned, um, you have also a lot of projects at Lonza ongoing and, and FEDA has also very huge amount of, of projects in, in different clinical phases, in pre-clinics, uh, we're producing commercials and so on and, and this area is changing a lot. And uh, this is maybe an advantage right now as a CDMO that uh, these dramatic topics which are coming up now, um, um, yeah, our team can work with these uh, um, challenges and, and work together. And that's um, uh, difficult <laughs> for sure right now, but uh, the team is on board and uh, looking forward to help our patients. Fantastic. I mean, that, that, it, it raises an interesting question, of course, because the focus, I suppose, is primarily on marketed product here, but clearly, certainly the CDMOs and, and Gilead and other folks are very heavily involved in clinical trial manufacturing and development. Um, are you seeing an impact on the ability to supply clinical trials material? And, and Jen, maybe you're, you're heavily involved in the supply side of that as well, I know. We're actually seeing an increase in, in options, um, you know, as, as we've heard, um, again, in, in, in the press, many companies are stepping up to perhaps they aren't, you know, an original manufacturer of a product, but they are working with the FDA and the CDC to get special permission to be able to allow for some additional pro products. And, and that's a great thing. And then we're working with them to try and get those products out into the market. Great. Thank you. And from a, from a CDMO perspective, I'm presuming you're still developing new drugs, you're still manufacturing clinical trials material, you've not switched to just supply um, uh, approved medicines. And, and you know, Nick, just to, to, to continue on that part, indeed, there is a shift today. We, we, we have some uh, uh, decrease, we can see today some decrease in terms of demand for clinical trials that are let's say that we are planned uh, uh, for some uh, uh, type of disease and we have an increase, significant increase of demand for compound starting new clinical study to treat the COVID-19. So here, and this is as well here where we, we need to be flexible because it's a, it's a priority. We need to make sure that we have the system and we have to work within uh, our colleagues in order to, to address such a need based on the technology that we have. And this is where I see that uh, the, the, the strong connection with the customer, uh, from one part, some clinical trial being on hold 
or sl significantly slowing down versus increased demand for new compound or for uh, uh, existing compound, but for clinical evaluation to treat patients with COVID-19. And um, this is here the, 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 the mandatory agility that we need to have in order to ad address uh, this, uh, this demand. Fantastic. And, and Rob, I know that you've done some specific work looking at the supply of vaccines and, and maybe the changes that we need to put in place for the supply chains going forward. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I think, um, you know, I think there's there's uh, a lot of weaknesses in the supply chain being exposed right now, um, you know, around around clinical trials, around vaccines. Uh, but as, as mentioned, around PPE, uh, API, and uh, uh, you know uh, CDMO, and and part of the challenge is that you know, we have over 24 countries that are restricting exports uh, to other countries. And as companies have diversified their global supply chains, um, especially on PPE equipment, which which largely went to China. Of course, China had um, you know their own their own uh, was the original location where where COVID got started, and so they largely sucked sucked up a lot of the PPE equipment globally into China to deal with that. And uh, again, also, I think 95, 90% of the masks, for instance, are, are produced in China. So what, what companies have done is they've outsourced essentially the low cost countries, but have lost a lot of uh, flexibility about this. Um, in, in a sense, I think, you know, this was uh, something that came up during the SARS epidemic and I actually wrote a paper about how to prepare for that epidemic and and how to deal with uh, you know these kinds of black swan events that occur simultaneously around the globe. It, it's not just one area of the globe and you can work around it. It's it's everybody is facing this. And I think part of the challenge there is that organizations are going to start moving back towards localization of sources. Um, it, it's and I think this is a natural progression where people are realizing when we have a crisis like this we need local supply and we need local manufacturing and so i think we're going to see uh you know the opposite of what happened a few years ago where a lot of big far big pharma companies were, were shutting down uh local supply uh and, and local sites and, and moving to global sites uh i think i think that may be changing in in the future great Th thanks very much rob <clears throat> I mean, just perhaps shifting gear a little bit and looking at what's actually happening in your factories. Um, Joy Depp, can you perhaps share with us some sort of best practices in terms of how you're able to to keep your factories running, um, particularly when obviously your staff are potentially impacted by the COVID virus, you know, the morale can be affected. Can, can you share any insights with what, how you're managing to keep that morale up and supply going? Yeah, so a great question, Nika. So there's a couple of things, right? The first thing is right, we um, you know, we talk very deeply about you know the fact that we have a patient mission, but the patient mission is only paralleled by a deep commitment towards our workforce, right? Both the the direct workforce we have as well as all our uh, all our incredibly valuable contract workforces that work on site. Uh, what we have done is we uh, I mean the priority is their safety, right? So the first thing we've done is we've um, We've identified those operations absolutely critical to not just the COVID-19 response. If you're working on a therapy uh, that's going to support uh, a, 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 a potential um, uh, solution to this, uh, but also just the ones that uh, ensure that keep uh, that, that we keep the operations in a compliant and um, and safe uh, sort of uh, zone right now. Uh, the two things we're doing a lot of right now is I've seen a phenomenal amount of communication. Uh, by all the leadership levels right now to ensure people realize that they're they're front and center in our minds and as leadership we we care very deeply about their not just their safety but their um, but their families as well uh, and and I think the increased velocity of communication coupled with sort of breaking down all those invisible barriers between who's an FTE who's a contract who's a supplier who's this now it's basically we're looking at if anyone's an occupant of a facility they're as important and that's had a very, very good impact on the morale because you know people want to come to Gilead campus because they know they're going to be safe, they're going to be taken care of. There are things we've done in terms of you know uh, in, ensuring the social distancing norms as well as uh, uh, food standards as well as availability of PPE is 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 there. Uh, but I think the communications coupled with breaking down some of these boundaries. Uh, the second part that we've also done right now is we've we've started to get really strategic 
uh, about the way, uh, and I'd love to know Christian's perspective being in supply chain planning, about what we really need to do in the next few months and the immediate future. You know, we're trying, trying to overwhelm, you know, so all our 2020 goals, all our 2020 imperatives are now being re-looked at to sort of say for the next quarter, what is truly essential? What can we defer? What can we delay? What can we outsource? What can we sort of lean on some other partners to work with? So there's an element of that that's left all our factories, um, uh, you know, in a very healthy state right now. It is also prompting a little bit of retrospective look at how do we structure our supply chains? How do we sort of, uh, you know, sort of put this nodes and, and, and network together for more resilience in the future? But I'm sure that is something that we as a collective industry will tackle once the dust settles down here. Great, thank you. And Lonza, how are you? What are you doing to make sure that your staff and workforce are are protected and more and morale is kept high at this time? So I will not uh, uh, say something very different from what Joy Deep said already. So the first things indeed is first to make sure that we are taking care about the safety of our uh, people. So we have immediately when we start having the this crisis implemented a strict rule on the, the way the people, first, who should be on site, who can work from home to limit the number of contact. We also followed the um, and local guidance in terms of uh, social distancing, in terms of uh, uh, the, 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 the way we operate. The, the cleaning procedure for pharmaceutical industry is already there, so it is uh, it just to maybe to reinforce this point for our uh, operator, knowing that they, they are already uh, having the, the, the good uh, gesture. But then linked to that is a communication. And what we have done is we are communicating on the weekly basis, providing the status of where we are as a network. And it's good to see that uh, uh, the people is not only okay guys we are working on the side but look there was also other people working on the other side and there is a kind of a, 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 a global commitment on our mission to deliver to the to the, our customer or their patients so communication to show where we stand in terms of our capability to deliver communication as well to listen to them what happened on site what can we do in order to help uh, them uh, uh, keeping on the continuing to, to work and to deliver and that's to me the, what we have done uh, for the time being successfully within Lonza, communication uh, at the site level, at the global level, on a weekly basis, plus uh, any all the protection, protective uh, uh, action required to manage properly the, our our collaborator. Great, thank you. And Timo, can you perhaps add to that from a VETA perspective? Uh, yeah, we have uh, more or less introduced uh, similar uh, measures uh, how we can save our our employees. Um, what we have in addition in regards on communication, uh, what we recognize that um, due to all the messages in the news and and uh, changing every day, uh, our um, colleagues have a lot of questions and uncertainties. So for this reason, we have implemented an internal COVID uh, hotline for our staff, for our employees. Um, and we have HR department, for example, included. And, um, and this hotline can answer most of the questions which are coming up or we uh, we, uh, we can put it in our uh, different boards and discuss it there. So this is very useful um, uh, in regards on the communication internally to our staff, um, explaining all the measures. For example, um, we have no, or we try to have no handover time in the different shifts. Um, we have organized with the uh, with the government in 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 the city of Ravensburg um, uh, for the children uh, schools everything are closed. Uh, what can we do there? Um, is somebody looking at the children because we need the people to work at FETA, so we cannot uh, stop every everything. Um, we brought the people at home to home office. Um, this is very easy, but what we do in production. Um, and for this reason, we organized also this and all these questions which came up, a lot of questions for sure. Um, we have introduced this hotline to um, improve and to professionalize the communication, which is really successful and helpful for our colleagues. Great, thank you. And Jen, of course, we, we all know about the thousands of people in the Brown Army that uh, are, part, are part of UPS. What, what are you doing to ensure morale and, uh, and people are keeping safe? 
Yeah, so certainly a huge, huge undertaking. Um, you know, obviously, first and foremost, we want to make sure that um, especially our, our drivers are equipped with supplies, um, that there's an understanding of safe deliveries. We have stopped some of our um, processes for requiring signatures wherever we can, uh, where the regulations allow. Um, you know, we are fortunate to be almost 500,000 employees strong, and, and these are employees that are extremely dedicated and do want to work. In some of our non, you know, package operations, um, we are looking at, uh, we have looked at sending uh, employees home and having them work from home and making sure that they are equipped accordingly. And there is a great deal of, of reporting that we're doing internally um, to ensure that uh, that we are keeping a pulse on on what the situations are, um, and then lastly, you're seeing really really interesting stories from our internal employees of how they are trying to be creative uh, and and find supplies that may not have been available in the mainstream. So whether it's um, some employees or employee relatives making masks for our own staff as not to take that supply away from some of the medical professionals, uh, trying to make uh, homemade hand sanitizers and things like that. I'm sure everyone else is hearing stories like that, um, but we're certainly proud of, of the, the ones that we see internally. And again, our focus is 100% is safety while trying to be there for uh, the world and, and, and deliver those, those packages and, and process those packages accordingly. Great, thank you very much. Um, one thing that sort of strikes us, and there's, there's a recurring theme of questions coming up around, clearly it, as the supply chains are becoming increasingly put under pressure, the need to look for alternative suppliers, not necessarily of registered materials, but of, of uh, PPEs or sanitizers or materials, whatever it might be, is increasingly there. How are you dealing with that in such a regulated environment in which we operate? In other words, how does our change control process allow you to find to sw switch out suppliers of material relatively quickly as opposed to how it's traditionally been where these the change control can take forever? Um, uh, Timo, perhaps from a better perspective, you might want to answer that. Um, yes, so uh, we have for sure also um, some supply issues, for example, with, as you mentioned, with some masks and with, with other uh, protection clothing materials. And uh, what was really impressive that in this difficult situation, when we uh, looked at other suppliers, at other sources, and we start discussion with our quality colleagues, with production colleagues, is there a way or, or under which um, circumstances we can implement another source and another product and for sure stick with GMP regulations. Um, we found uh, a lot of ways and different ways how we can implement um, other sources very fast, uh, having a change control procedure, everything in place, but much more faster than we have it normally if everything is fine. So there is a much more collaboration and openness, willingness um, to, to have other ideas, to have other sol solutions available um, uh, to have the supply of these uh, critical materials in place. And it was really yeah, nice to see that uh, what is possible um, when you collaborate together, uh, seeing the points from each department working together that we can do this quite fast, implementing other sources, for example, and stick with GMP regulations for sure. And Lonza, uh, Christian, I'm presuming you're doing something very similar. Exactly. You know, as Timo said, the GMP rules are not changing. So we need to respect that. When we have a matter that is already described in the registration dossier, it takes anyhow some regulatory times, let's say, to, to, to change this. But uh, uh, the strength of the, the CDMO is that we are dealing with so many different sourcing for the different customers, so we have a huge databases. So within Lonza, we are more than 900 projects live. And uh, sometimes we are using multiple basic stuff like sodium chloride because it is what uh, the customer is requiring and we have a huge database in terms of comparability data. So uh, when we need to uh, activate such things, 
you, we can use already the data that are existing and to uh, and it will shorten significantly the, the time needed to, to to get approval for second sourcing that's one of the strengths in addition to that when we have the resources that is uh, sorry uh, the raw material that is not described in the dossier then it is easy because here we can pick directly on the what we have sometimes already in stock uh, assuming we have the same specification for sure but uh, here it's it's even very 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 fast because we have as well here a lot of data and the change control is moving very fast uh, and uh, Gilead um, I mean again you'll be facing the same issues I'm sure Joy that yeah, yeah, it is. And I think, uh, obviously, right, we, we're not um, uh, abandoning just good fundamental change control processes. What we have changed, Nick, is uh, is is a, applying a more, um, um, almost a curious approach towards things where we are looking at what is truly necessary for uh, uh, engineering, construction, product safety, and, and, and compliance. And, and finding ways to substitute things uh, in a very risk-based, but almost, I would argue, a more analytical fashion than we were used to in the past. So it goes back to the initial point I made that it's driving and spurring a ton of innovation and, uh, and uh, you know, very similar to some of the initiatives the agencies brought out with PAT and QBD, et cetera, around truly understanding your process, truly understanding those attributes that are critical to the the, the the safety efficacy or of anything you do be it you know building a building or be it a uh, releasing a batch and then and then but you know sort of safeguarding those and then uh, ensuring uh, uh, substitutability uh, is is sort of evaluated and looked at uh, with the language of critical attributes and impact to the final product as opposed to just uh, the, the, the substitute itself or the change itself driving a a random conversation so so there is that element of uh, of innovation that's that's helping us do this, but I think someone made a point, maybe this team or the, um, you know, what's what's what I'm seeing tremendously is a lot of collaborations, be it intra department, intra site within the company, and then extending beyond the four walls of the company to the local agencies, the cities, all the regulatory bodies that tend to uh, manage our changes as well. That's a fantastic point. The whole collaboration is. You find, are you finding that it's changing the environment in which you're working, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Sorry. And, and and Rob, I don't know if you if you have any perspective on this. Oh, oh very. Yeah, I think there's uh, th this issue of collaboration is 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 really fundamental. And um, as everyone's been pointing out, you know, when you when you have a a crisis of this uh, of this magnitude. Uh, you have to you have to make do, and and this is happening at at the hospital level where um, you know they're making do and they're working with local agencies uh, at NC State. We have a college of textiles that's using um, you know, new new spun material, uh, a non wovens lab that's actually constructing masks using three D printers for you know local hospitals, and and we're seeing uh, a lot of that you know kind of activity going on as well. And um, <clears throat> the other point I want to make as well is I think it's also really important that people don't forget about their suppliers. Um, what happened during the 2008-2009 crisis, and, and we have data that showed this, is organizations that reached out to their suppliers to check on them, particularly uh, around their financial stability, um, their level of working capital, th their ability to uh, get financing. Uh, w was was really important because if you're not in communication with those suppliers and you, you're not ordering from them, then six months later you go in and check on them, they may not be around. So so it really is important to ensure that the uh, suppliers that are that are key for our raw material in packaging supply chains are are maintaining their health as well, and and that happens through open communication. Well, that's a very valid point. I mean, the whole security supply chain isn't just the front line here, is it? It's everybody in it and all the suppliers to it. Christian, are Alonzo doing anything particular around ensuring the, um, that their, your suppliers are there for the long term? So, uh, for who were uh, the, the, the first things, uh, we are. Uh, once we have long-term contract, for sure, we are uh, having also some uh, procurement action with the supplier for that. So this is here where we are uh, uh, looking ahead. 
there was also all the we discussed about the PP, but PP is also a good example because it is the, the, the mandatory material we need to produce uh, whatever the customer here. And this is as well here where we have uh, dual sourcing, where we have also a long term contract uh, in order to uh, help us to manage uh, such a type of, uh, of a crisis. So it is every time we have the possibility to really uh, have forecast long term forecast. There is here as well some dedicated action to secure the the, the supply for uh, for a long term period. It is more difficult to be honest when we are dealing with clinical trial. We don't know what will happen with the product. So here it is, uh, and particularly because we are dealing with sometimes single source, it is a little bit more difficult. But here as well, in terms of we talk about the agility of uh, the, the, the CDM organization, it also requires a lot of agility for the procurement organization within Onza in order to at the same time, and despite a uh, uh, limited volume, uh, able to, to, to secure the the, 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 the supply with the, the appropriate contract with the supplier. Yeah. Great, thank you. I'm going to change gear again a little bit um, and, and look towards perhaps the future. One of the questions that I think was very, very interesting that came up, and it sort of talked, is just in time dead? Um, Georgie, do, do you want to perhaps comment on that? Well, you know, the funny part about it is this this kind of uh, pandemic response shows us that there isn't a supply chain model that we can say is dead, right? I think, Nick, you talked a lot about some of your old work in GSK, and what's relevant today is is going to be outdated tomorrow, and, and what's outdated today may be relevant tomorrow. So, um, so the funny part about uh, this is what you're hearing all the panelists talk about is, is you know, we got to be just be agile, right? I mean, uh, this just-in-time philosophy around having, uh, you know, uh, very personalized medicines, having low inventory levels, uh, everything that we've touted as the results of a industrial 4.0 revolution around pharmaceutical efficiency has, has, has uh, you know, have brought some interesting concerns when you can't get your workforce in a facility or when in, in a site, etc. And and you know, supply chains that have been heavily reliant on large inventory stocks, which were touted as being super inefficient in the past are ones that now are being touted as super resilient. So it's an interesting dilemma and one that I have not thought through completely. But but what I will say, I think, is that this has taught us that you know we, we really can't be arrogant about having a one model that drives a pervasive view on how we structure our supply chain. What I think we can learn from this right now is a, our, our ability to react to the next crisis that will occur will be less a function of the dominant supply chain model you've chosen but it truly will be our culture of agility and our culture of innovation, and our culture of driving change and accepting change and reacting appropriately. And I think there, um, there's, there's a lot of good lessons from here, but I don't think just in times dead because I do believe we will get over this crisis and we will go back to where, uh, you know, some of the just in time paradigms have led unprecedented value that we've turned back, not just to the shareholder, but in terms of, of innovative therapies to the patients. Uh, but a long answer to a really short question, but it's a deep philosophical question that I think um, you know I'd encourage ISP to ponder about as we as we um, as we look towards future you know supply chain models uh, going forward. Fantastic, Th thank you, Charlie. Um Rob, I know that you've also done a lot of work in this space. Have you any thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm I'm writing a book on this this very topic actually around. Um, you know the next generation of supply chains, and I, I don't believe JIT is dead. I think um, I think the issue is you know not so much do we keep less inventory, but where do we keep the inventory, uh, and how do we develop uh, you know as Joydeep said agile agile supply chains. I, and I think velocity of material flow is is critical while looking at at security of supply. And you know it's interesting you know in other industries in the automotive industry suppliers tend to be tend to be local uh, and there's a reason for that it's not just for JIT but it's also around effective communication and velocity of, of material movement and so I think we're we're really going to uh, start to look at from that perspective how do we uh, how do we drive greater collaboration and, and not just make that decision based on low price and 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 thinking about you know the, the overall supply and, and I would argue that, you know, people are also going to start rethinking uh, stockpiles. You know, it's, it's difficult 
uh, you know, at a national level, each country has their own stockpile of material, which is now rapidly being depleted. And I think organizations also need to rethink their business continuity planning. And, you know, it's difficult, you know, before a pandemic to say, well, what's the ROI on, on keeping a bunch of material in, uh, in a stockpile? Well, that becomes very clear, you know, when you have an event like this. And by the way, I, I, I believe this isn't an isolated event. Uh, I've read some things where, uh, you know, these, these kinds of COVID viruses could uh, recur. Uh, and there may even be a, a vaccine, a corona vaccine that that becomes uh, part of the, uh, you know, part of the the, the, the the ecosystem as well in conjunction with, you know, the, the flu vaccine. And uh, these these types of vaccines, uh, I think this is a more regular event that we need to be prepared for. And I think organizations are really going to rethink this going forward. Absolutely. Thank you very much. We're rapidly running out of time and we've got loads of questions more to answer. But what I'll perhaps do is, is hand it over to each of you in, in, in turn to just if there's a takeaway that you'd like the audience uh, to, to take from this, from this uh, webinar in terms of how they can perhaps improve their supply chains or ensure the supply of products. Uh, maybe you can, you can, you can uh, provide your perspective as a, as a sort of takeaway. So I'll start with you, Joydeep. I think one big takeaway for us right now, I think I'll piggyback up Rob's comment around um, the ROI on risk management processes is for companies who take risk planning, risk management, all these exercises more seriously. I think things that we we sort of uh, uh, considered afterthought in terms of tabletop exercises and simulations uh, are now becoming, you know, uh, are manifesting themselves in reality and uh, the worst time to find your readiness and preparedness during a crisis is during the crisis itself. So I think a, a general appreciation for risk, risk processes, risk management, risk governance, um, you know, not to paralyze the organization, but to have a healthy appreciation for that uh, and, and make sure we don't forget this during times when there isn't a crisis. So that's my big takeaway uh, in terms of a tip to try and take this forward. Thank you very much. And uh, Christian, if I can perhaps ask you what, what your takeaway would be? The same. The same, so it is the risk management is becoming the, the key driver here. And a dynamic risk management. It is not because you have done that once that it's over. So every thing that will happen in the months, in the day, today it's every day is changing, need to feed this risk management to, to adapt and to reassess if what we are if we are really equipped for, for the, 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 the risk that we may face. So there is obviously every time the balance between uh, 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 the level of preparation versus the cost. But uh, I do believe that the risk management linked to the agility are the two driver for a, a better efficient supply chain. Fantastic. And, and Timo, from a VETA perspective? I, I would totally agree that this uh, risk management, supplier risk, supply chain risk management, if you start uh, this discussion, you want to start a project uh, with this topic, uh, nobody from management or from your stakeholders is clapping his hands. In the event that somebody something happens like now, everybody is talking about this and I hope um, that uh, the sustainability of uh, supply chain or supplier risk management uh, will be increased in future and uh, also not talking about cost and, and uh, buffer stocks cost money and uh, resources or capacities not used are also costing money so it's more what does it cost if there is no uh, stock available and you need to shut down your production um, or if there is no free capacity and you have these kind of events how to react uh, maybe you lose more money and also to include in your supplier or supply chain risk assessments topics which are most likely not included today. Today, most of these um, approaches look at uh, fire disasters and bankruptcy of your suppliers and flooding and so on. But I guess uh, when the volcanic eruption and the influence on the aviation came up, nobody has uh, in the supply uh, risk assessment, this volcanic eruption assessed, or the nuclear disaster in Japan, maybe also nobody has looked at this, but these disasters in a global 
world with uh, linked network, supply chain network, they happened and they influence all the supply chains and everybody uh, feels it now and it's, it's really serious and hopefully uh, we learn something out of it and be more prepared in the future and not four years later uh, everybody is asking again, oh, what are your logistics cost per unit and bring them down and uh, have the just in time principle uh, in place again. So I want also to say it's not that, but maybe a little bit more that than yesterday, but looking forward, what happens with this uh, just in time principle. Fantastic, thank you. And Jen, from a UPS perspective, what would you like us to take away? So I think for us, this certainly has been a call to action. And while we thought we had really good um, business continuity plans, I, I guarantee that that we and, and everyone probably is going to look at those plans in hindsight and see if, if they made sense. Um, for us, we are, you know, really working on being compliant, but being nimble at the same time. And for us, the relationships that we have developed with the regulatory agencies has really been helpful for us. And we've been able to have communication to understand what is, you know, allowable and, and what flexibility we can have during, during this time. So I think all of those, those things have allowed us to, to, to try and help um, the industry uh, continue moving forward. But I do think that reflection is going to be a significant activity that we're all going to see after this is over. Fantastic. And, and finally, Rob, from your perspective, what would you say the takeaway is? Yeah, I think there's several key points that, that come up. And I think, uh, you know, people will look at, you know, pre-COVID and post-COVID uh, world and, and, and look at the differences. Um, you know, I, I think today that, that we, have to, uh, we have to really understand uh, and consider a multi-stakeholder environment, uh, our employees, our customers, uh, our suppliers, and, and, uh, and really, you know, look at the impact uh, on all of these different uh, stakeholders. I think the importance of data and models is really critical right now. Um, there is a lot of information that's available out there on uh, hospital demand. Um, you know, the Helena Group is, is developing some great insights. Um, and, and I think that that ability to look at, um, you know, multi-tier visibility will be important. Uh, in the future, I think the, the emphasis on governance, you know, there really isn't a good, at least in the United States, there isn't a, a very good central planning uh, function around the supply and demand of, of critical materials uh, to support healthcare and to support hospitals. So I think there's a need for much more public and private sector coordination industry group collaboration and as people have pointed out you know necessity is the mother of, of invention and i think in the next two weeks um we're going to have to really start putting our heads together uh with with our engineering teams with our product development teams with our customer teams and come up with solutions for uh what are going to be some very difficult times ahead um so that's that's all i have Thanks. Thank you, Robin, and thank you all very much. And I think this has been a very powerful and very informative um, session. Unfortunately, we're, we're coming to the hour when, when the session closes. Uh, but again, thank you very much. A really insightful. And unfortunately for everybody out there who is listening, uh, we had way more questions than we could ever possibly have hoped to answer in this, in this short period. Um, Barbara, shall I pass it back to you to close? Sure, thank you, Nick. Um, on behalf of ISPE, I would like to thank Nick and Oliver for helping to moderate today's session and for our panelists for taking time out of their incredibly busy schedules to join us uh, to give us a little bit more of, under, of an understanding of the current environment from a supply chain perspective. Um, for those who've asked, we will be distributing the recording from this session uh, probably tomorrow. Um, we will, we, we've also created a dedicated page on the ISPE website that includes links to resources you might find helpful, um, as well as we've created a COVID-19 discussion forum on the ISPE community. Um, now, this is a place where members can go and share information. So if you've read an article or a blog post that you think would be of interest to members, or if you just want to communicate some issues that you've been, you've been facing in your site, um, please join that. You can find the link on the homepage of the community or reach out to ISPE and we'll help you find it. Um, 
Now, I want to just say that we are aware that many of our members are working from home. And so if you've enjoyed the content presented today, um, we'd like to encourage you to also explore the ISPE site um, to catch up on other professional development. Um, it is a great time to catch up on the community, view past webinars, podcasts, blog posts, and PE articles, or to study a new guide. Um, to find these resources, you can see uh, ISPE.org. And finally, we would appreciate your feedback on today's session, as well as your ideas for upcoming topics um, and areas for improvement. You can email those to ispeak at ispe.org. Um, we hope that everyone is staying safe and healthy and that um, a life will eventually get back to normal before too long. Thank you and have a great day.